chair of the Diabetes and Metabolism Research Center at University of Utah Health. <laughs> Dr. Summers' entire professional career has been devoted to the study of diabetes, with his interest having been born shortly after his own father's diagnosis with the disease. Scott committed to his dad that he was going to solve this problem, and he continues to work on that. So please welcome Scott Summers. All right. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. Um, well, thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, I'm, I'm thrilled and honored to see so many people here. Just with the microphone. Sorry, bud. Oh. Okay. Uh, I'm just thrilled to see everybody here, and it's really an honor. And you know what's happening in the College of Health right now is is really exciting under Dave's leadership. And, and I'm particularly excited to tell you about what's happening in our department, nutrition and integrative physiology, which launched in 2016. So before I do that, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my own personal story in this. Sorry, I'm getting some weird feedback. So I want to tell you about my own personal journey a little bit and tell you about why I got started in this business. And I want to tell you a little bit about why I made this claim, ceramides is the next cholesterol, which is a little bit of a bold statement. <laughs> and so um, I hope you don't think I'm crazy after you see, hear what I have to say. Okay, so as Dave mentioned, my journey into this business started when I was 14 years old. My father got a phone call and he heard that his mother was about to die. She'd had diabetes and they told her she was going to die within the next week. And so he rushed to the hospital. He had a cold at the time. He sat by her bed for a week and he, um, he emerged from the hospital. Um, she actually lived for another 10 years, uh, completely healthy. Um, yeah. He emerged from the hospital drinking water at every opportunity and running to the bathroom every second. And he had a blood sugar of 800. So he developed diabetes when he was 38 years old. Um, he didn't look like your classic type 2 diabetic. He was running five miles a day. He was a fairly athletic individual. Um, he was running eight minute miles, but he seemed to be somebody who had um, you know, did not look like the kind of person that he was relatively fit. Um, after he became diabetic, my father was a scholar and he was somebody, and that's something I've always admired about him and tried to emulate. So he, um, he read everything he could about the disease and he learned everything he could about the disease. And one of the things he learned very early was that, um, that exercise helped. So he decided, okay, I'm going to do everything I can with exercise to cure my diabetes. So he would wake up in the middle of the night. If his blood sugar was high, he would run out and he would run five miles. And he kept doing this to the point that at one point my, my friend told me, your dad's becoming one big leg. Um, he, was, he ended up becoming a really accomplished athlete. He won the 10K Masters in three different states. He ran marathons. He was incredibly fit. Despite that, his diabetes worsened and he went on insulin in only a very short period of time after the disease. Uh, he has dealt with this diabetes for the last, uh, gosh, 40 some odd years since and, um, and has tried to manage it throughout with exercise. And this is a picture of my father just a year ago when he was running his last, the last road race he did. Um, he's not in quite as good a shape and he doesn't run quite as fast anymore. But uh, he's still somebody who's really active. But he's struggled with the disease. There's no doubt about the fact that this is an exhausting disease. It's a debilitating condition. It, it's never ending. And he's really struggled with hypoglycemia and different problems with this. But nonetheless, we're fortunate by the fact that he's, he's relatively healthy uh, at the age of 79. So like my father, I decided then that I was going to learn everything I could about this disease. And I was going to try and study diabetes and get a sense of how this happened. And that turned out to be kind of a cool thing because 
diabetes is kind of an interesting uh, condition to study, and it's got a pretty good history. So one of the first things I learned was that in 1674, one of the first diabetes tests was to actually, they, they would look and see whether somebody was diabetic or not by tasting their urine. So if it was sweet, then they could determine that somebody had this impairment in sugar metabolism and was diabetic. Now, I always tell the students, always read the literature. Because it turns out, this had been described 2,000 years earlier in uh, an Egyptian papyrus that they found in a tomb. So, but nonetheless, this was the first glucose test. Um, I don't make my students do this as part of a hazing ritual, though it has crossed my mind. Um, so, shortly after that, it became clear that a lot of people, when they presented with diabetes, on autopsy, they would have this impairment in the pancreas, and they would have this shriveled up looking pancreas. And so a lot of people thought, oh, I bet that's where the defect is. So this really famous French physiologist, Claude Bernard, and, and I'm going to tell you something negative about him, but he actually did amazing things, and he's an incredible scientist. Um, but this particular experiment led him astray. So what he had done, and so, so I have to say, his, he, his wife divorced him because he was very interested in experimenting on animals. So he would have these dogs running around the house with cannulas and fistulas and all these things. And so she thought he was a bit crazy, so she left him. But he kept working on it. And one of the things he did was he decided he would get rid of the pancreas and see what happened to the dog and whether that caused diabetes. So. He took the pancreas, and his pancreas has this duct that goes to the intestine. And 99% of the pancreas, its job is to secrete digestive enzymes that degrade the foods that we eat. So he put a bunch of paraffin oil in that, and he ligated that, and the whole pancreas fell apart. So he thought, the animal never got diabetic. So he thought, well, that's not it. So for 100 years, we went away from the pancreas as a site of diabetes because he had proved that that was not the case. But it turned out the one part of the pancreas that remained, these little shrivels of pancreas, were the 1% of the pancreas that secretes insulin. The islets of Langerhans, which are these endocrine cells which are completely separated from the exocrine pancreas, which secretes these digestive enzymes. And this was still intact. And so what happened was, about 100 years later, Oscar Minkowski removed this pancreas. He looked at the dogs. There was a bunch of... He, the dogs were going to the bathroom more frequently. There were flies floating around the top of the of the, that particular cage. He got curious. He did the taste test. And it was sweet. So he had discovered that, sure enough, the pancreas was relevant to diabetes, and this was the proof positive. About 40 years later, um, the story took a really dramatic turn when uh, fr um, Fred Banting went to Toronto and he set up a laboratory. He was a, he was a sort of a failed surgeon, had never done much science, but he had written this journal entry that if he took that approach that Claude Bernard did and he ligated the pancreatic duct, he could take the remaining sh um, shrivels of pancreas and try and isolate this, this molecule, which by then they thought probably was secreted from the pancreas to regulate glucose. And he did that. The dogs lived. Um, they are, um, he was able to purify this molecule um, insulin uh, with the help of a, a, a chemist, Philip Kala. They were able to give back the insulin and cure these dogs of diabetes, um, despite the fact that, that they'd had their um, pancreas removed. This is um, Charlie Best. Charlie Best lost a coin flip, and so had to work with Fred Banting over the summer. Um, and they ended up getting the Nobel Prize in 1922. So one of the remarkable things, they started their first experiment in animals in 1921, and they went into people in 1922. So one year from preclinical models to clinical tests to a therapy in the, that, that doesn't happen today, that's right, <laughs> that's exactly right. Um, as I'll, I'll, you, you'll see proof of that in a bit. 
So this is a picture of the lab. Um, this is a picture of the actual tracing where they were looking at the glucose that the dog was, um, that the, the, they could measure in the dogs. And, um, and you can see they could give insulin and the glucose would go down and then come back up. It's a pretty remarkable story. If you actually, uh, I, the, I had the opportunity to meet the autobiographer who, um, who wrote this, or the biographer who wrote this story, and um, he found some of the patients 100 years later or 80 years later that had gotten that initial insulin, and, um, and it really transformed them. It took kids that were destined for death, and, and some of them lived for another 80 years afterwards. And there are all these dramatic stories about what happened. So that was my knowledge, completing um, my undergraduate, and I decided to go to grad school, and then I had the opportunity to uh, go to Philadelphia to start a postdoc. And, and this red line is because you're, I'm going to take you through a little bit of a journey here. I have moved somewhat nomadically. I'm kind of, you know, if I see something shiny, I go after it, and so that's sort of a problem in my personality and character. So I've, it's given me the opportunity to travel all over the world and in the process do a little bit of science. And so I'm going to tell you a little bit about this story. And it starts in Philadelphia with a postdoc. I was in uh, the, the laboratory of Morris Birnbaum, a really brilliant scientist. And one of the things I learned was that my father's situation in diabetes was not really all that uncommon. You know, we think about type 1 diabetes, we think about type 2, and we have this vision of two extremes. Type 1s are all kids, type 2s are all really heavy people that are inactive, they get it late in life, they're insulin resistant, um, earlier, you know, kids that get it, type 1 diabetes, they don't produce insulin, but it turns out there are a whole bunch of intermediates in between this, and that those two extremes really don't capture the complexity of this incredible disorder, and that people will present at different times in life, they'll present, some will be different ages, some will have more of the metabolic syndrome, the obesity type things, the, the, the parameters that we measure associate with type 2, but some will not, and there'll be all kinds of intermediates. Some will produce more insulin than others, you know, it's some point diabetes results because we fail to produce enough insulin from the pancreas to accommodate for, to, to meet the body's needs. The other thing I learned is that there's a big relationship between obesity and the development of diabetes and that this is something that is getting worse and worse over time and so a lot of you have seen this type of an image before showing the percent of obesity by state and this is a problem that is growing in uh, to epidemic proportions uh, with more than 30 percent of the, the population obese. <coughs> But this raises a question too. This didn't look like my father at all. And we know that there are a lot of people that are obese that never get diabetes, and there are a lot of people that are relatively lean that do get diabetes. So how do we explain this difference um, in this disorder? And so when I was in Philadelphia, I had the opportunity to meet this individual, uh, the late Dennis McGarry from UT Southwestern. And he posed the question, what would have happened if Minkowski the guy that removed the pancreas from the dog was a guzik. Meaning what would have happened if he had no sense of taste? He wouldn't have been able to do the, the urine test to, te to tell whether this animal was diabetic. What he might have done is he might have smelled it. And what he would have found is that there not only are changes in sugar metabolism, but there are a lot of changes in fat metabolism. And you can actually smell that in the ketone bodies that the body produces. And he said, well, what happens if we flip diabetes on its head? It's not about the sugar, it's about the fat. And his colleague at the time, um, Roger Unger, also at UT Southwestern, coined this phrase lipotoxicity. So the idea was that the problem isn't necessarily too much fat, but it's too much fat in the wrong place. And when the fat spills out in the tissues where it doesn't belong, when it spills out of a fat cell which is designed to store triglyceride and starts to accumulate in blood vessels or the pancreas or the heart, then it gives damage and it gives rise to toxic lipid species, toxic fat molecules that drive tissue damage because those tissues aren't designed to store fat safely. So it's really a measure of the, this accumulation of fat in the wrong place. And one of the pieces of evidence we have for that is that not only do people with obesity develop diabetes, 
But people that have a complete inability to make fat cells and to store fat, people with lipodystrophy that are incredibly thin, if they have an impairment in their ability to store fat, they also develop the same spectrum of conditions. So they also develop diabetes and heart disease and the things that we associate with obesity. And so this, this influenced me a lot, and I like this idea, and this sounded like something that might be worth studying. So around that time, I'd finished my postdoc. I decided I would start my own lab, and I moved to the mountains. I actually moved to Colorado first. I'm doing a little flyby to Colorado to, to go right to Utah, but I came to Utah. And I joined the Department of Medicine, and I asked the question, well, which of those fat molecules would be so toxic? Could we find the toxic fat, the bad fat that was causing those tissues to fail and was driving diabetes? And so it turns out when fat gets to a cell, it, it only has a few different routes. Now there are about 60,000 different fat metabolites or molecules that you can detect in a cell. So it's not a trivial number, but they fall in one of three families. So the fat can either be coupled to carnitine, which is a molecule that shuttles it to mitochondria. These are the organelles that help convert fat into energy. So that's one fate. It can be burned. So if you're exercising a lot, you get a lot more of these and it burns the fat. And that's a good thing. The other thing it can do, of course, it can be coupled to glycerol, which is a product of glucose metabolism. And it can give rise to these triglycerides. Triglycerides are the major storage form of the body. And that's something, if you can do that and keep the, serum, or the, um, the fat there, that's probably a good thing. But what happened is a little bit of the fat spills out and it gets coupled to this molecule serine, which is a, a product of protein metabolism, and it gives rise to these molecules ceramides. Now you've heard about ceramides, you've heard about ceramide creams. I just got a video from my good friend Katsu Funai today showing me that Reese Witherspoon is, is selling ceramide capsules now on YouTube. So you may have heard of these. But it turns out inside the cell, these things are pretty bad. And we think these things are pretty toxic. And if we blocked the production of this um, pathway, if we blocked the ability of fatty acids to be coupled to this serine in a mouse, we could completely prevent the development of diabetes. And it turns out we don't just prevent diabetes, we prevent diabetes, we prevent hypertension, we prevent heart disease, we prevent cardiomyopathy, uh, hepatic steatosis, steatohepatitis, oh, atherosclerosis. Trevor, my graduate student, am I missing something? Hypertension. <laughs> Hypertension, yes. Um, so Trevor's a PhD student. I'm going to show you a little bit of his work uh, here, but I encourage you to talk to him afterwards and ask any questions, because he actually does stuff in the lab, unlike me, and, and knows some of the experiments we do. But this is an experiment we did about 10 years ago in Utah, where we showed if we blocked the production of ceramide, you could take a, a this is a rat that becomes diabetic, develops frank hyperglycemia. If you gave this drug, you prevented the de development of hyperglycemia entirely, and the animal never got diabetic. But it was time to move again. <laughs> so I saw something shiny. And um, I will tell you, when Fred Banting, um, this is an aside, when Fred Banting decided to clone insulin, or discover insulin, not clone it, discover it, in 21. It had actually probably been discovered 10 years earlier, but a guy in Kansas, his girlfriend broke up with him and he decided to quit working on it and quit studying insulin and go and try and rescue his relationship, which he, I don't know if he did or not, but for 10 years we didn't have insulin as a result of that, that decision. Um, so like the guy in Kansas, I decided to move to Singapore. Uh, I got an opportunity to move to Singapore with the Duke Medical School. So Duke started this campus in Singapore. I, part of my lab moved to North Carolina, so I was flying back and forth, and I got to live in Asia. And I always liked Utah, so I did come back. But we learned a few things in Singapore, and I'm just going to give you some very high-level snapshots. One of the things we learned is that there are different types of ceramides. Of course, it's got to be a little more complicated. You've heard of good cholesterol, bad cholesterol. We have good ceramides, we have bad ceramides. We're able to learn what those are. If they have a really long chain of fat, fat on them, they're, they're good. If they've got a shorter chain, they're bad. And it turns out, one in four of you in this room 
probably have a mutation in this gene that predisposes you to diabetes. And we think it causes you to make a lot more of these bad ceramides, this mutation. One in four people in Utah have this mutation. The other thing we learned is that it's not just the amount of fat that comes in, but there are a lot of other things that control how many ceramides you make or you accumulate. So the flow of nutrients affects it. Turns out inflammation and infections like the cold my father had also drive up the production of ceramides. And there's quite a body of literature on certain viruses and certain forms of diabetes. We also learned there's some things that decrease ceramides um, besides starving yourself. Uh, exercise is good, so that decreases ceramides. We learned that if you just hang out in the cold um, for a long time, um, that causes your ceramides to go down. Um, we also learned, um, and this was discovered by Will Holland. Will's here somewhere. Will's a new recruit to uh, the Department of Nutrition and Integrative Physiology. And when Will was um, doing some studies at UT Southwestern, he discovered that this molecule of dipinectin actually catalyzes the degradation of ceramides. This is an anti-diabetic cardioprotective hormone and Will figured out how it was and then we decided to steal them from Texas and bring them back to Utah. So that was a good thing. And so then, once again seeing something shiny, I moved to Melbourne, Australia. And one of the things we became quite keen to do in Australia was to understand the, the human relevance of this, the therapeutic power of this. Simultaneously, uh, a friend of mine in uh, Finland, Reisko Laksonen, he, started, he created this company, Zora Biosciences, and they started looking for molecules in the blood that would predict the development of, uh, his biggest readout was death. So a pretty important readout, death from cardiovascular disease. And what he found was, that plasma ceramides were the best predictor he'd ever seen of this cardiovascular mortality, much better than LDL cholesterol. So he marketed this test. The Mayo Clinic is now measuring it. You can have your ceramides measured right now at the Mayo, and they'll give you a score and tell you whether your ceramides are high or not. It, it actually has inter produced some interesting uh, dilemmas for me because I often get calls from people saying my ceramides are high what do I do and I have a fairly unsatisfying answer you know which is um, exercise or hang out in the cold um, and to be honest I'm not sure which people dislike more um, they, they, um. so anyway our premise right now is that we think ceramides are the new cholesterol may be worse than cholesterol. We think unlike cholesterol, which is sort of a sticky molecule in the blood, a lot of what cholesterol does when you intervene with cholesterol with statins is you actually don't just affect cholesterol. So this, these are, you've probably heard about statins. They lower your cholesterol, but they not only lower cholesterol, they actually lower lipoproteins in the circulation, including ceramides. All the things that are carried alongside cholesterol um, are also affected by this because cholesterol is one of the key determinants of lipoprotein levels. But we postulated this question, could ceramides become the new cholesterol? And this suggests that one could intervene in the pathway and develop drugs or come up with other strategies or maybe understand the genetics. You know, if we could identify people like the one in four people that are predisposed to accumulate ceramides, maybe we could go and make a personalized diet recommendation to them. You have a sensitivity to saturated fats. We think you will, will turn those into ceramides. And this might be a way of giving a personalized dietary intervention rather than having one dietary intervention or suggestion for everybody. So this is largely the premise of what we've been working on. Um, so is there anything we can do about it? So let me tell you about the, the latest new piece of study. And this is Trevor's data here. This is Trevor's uh, mouse um, that he likes to hang out and hold on his pocket. Um, it turns out ceramides have this key double bond in the molecule right here. And we think, here's your structure. I told you I would give you a structure, so this is it. Um, so this is what ceramides look like. 
there's this key double bond right here that we think is really important for the way ceramides pack in the membrane. And we came up with the idea, if we got rid of that double, or if we, um, yeah, if we got rid of that double bond, we could still generate all the ceramides. It could do all the stuff that they still need to do in the body, but they wouldn't have some of these toxic effects. And so we made a mouse where all the ceramides, or most of the ceramides, lack this double bond. The mouse is fine. It runs around. And once again, if you make, put that on a diabetic mouse strain, the mouse never develops diabetes. Or it never develops impaired glucose tolerance. I should be more precise because we haven't yet done an extreme diabetes model. So we think this is a therapeutic strategy. Um, um, I partnered with some private um, some private individuals who do drug development. We've made a drug against this. Uh, it's the Centaurus Therapeutics. The drug also lowers glucose. So we think this is going to be the new approach to lower your ceramides and improve your metabolic health. So my recommendation for everybody is keep your fat in the right place. Okay? <laughs> Keep it in the fat cell or keep it out of the body, which is better yet, um, but don't let it go into those ceramides. So that's the story of ceramides. That's the story of, um, of sort of my research program and what we're thinking about. Now about two, two years ago, and I will say some of this work that I just presented was not done in Australia or Singapore, it was done here. About two years ago, I got an email from a friend of mine who said, from Utah, and they said, hey, you ought to see what they're doing in the College of Health. It's really incredible, and we're going to create, one of the things they want to do is create this new department, Nutrition and Integrative Physiology. And a lot of us think you would be a good fit for that department. So would you consider applying? So at first I said, well, look, I'm sitting on the beach in Australia. I'm very happy. I've only been here 15 months, or actually at that time eight months. I said, even I don't move that quickly. <laughs> But I got to thinking more and more about what that department could look like. And I came and I met some of the people in that department and saw how, how professional they were and how great they were and dedicated they were to teaching students and things. And I kept thinking about it and more and more I decided this would be a good thing to do. And so you've heard this phrase metabolic health and we decided this is a new department but it's, so it's built on a division of nutrition but they've added in this integrative physiology piece and this is what we mean by that. Some people ask me what's integrative physiology mean. The way we view this is we try and develop, build a department that thinks about physiology from the perspective of fuel metabolism. Every organ requires energy and every organ requires, you know, all of its molecules come from food. And so our question is, how can we link up that fuel metabolism to tissue function in a way that we understand how tissues work, thinking about the fuel that comes in? And oftentimes, you know, we think about, you know, you'll hear all these things in the news about our fat's good, our protein's good, our sugar's good. Those fats, proteins, and sugars get converted into 60,000 lipids, a million proteins, and 40,000 intermediary metabolites. So something happens in between here. And we'd like to figure out what that is and how that influences disease with the idea that if we can keep your ceramides low, if we can control your metabolic health, that that will ward off conditions like diabetes and cancer. So this cartoon, I think, summarizes what our department is all about. And so you see this guy, you know, he's doing an, a complex equation. He's posing the question here. He's got the solution here. And his work in between is then a miracle occurs. And I think that's kind of what happens here. If we go from here to here, and then a miracle occurs in between. And so that's what our department's about, trying to figure out what that miracle actually is. Okay, so metabolic health. So every form of disease, cancer, infectious disease, diabetes, they all have hallmarks of changes in the way they metabolize nutrients. 
is a key feature of all of those diseases. And we think one can target those. We think one can intervene in those. We think you can intervene maybe with drugs. You can intervene by figuring out what those defects are. And then by making diet recommendations specifically around these changes so that we can make an informed decision per disease, per person, per gene to advise how do we improve our metabolic health and prevent this dysfunction that drives these diseases. So we've created this department centered around this. Um, one of the big things we wanted to do is develop research programs. Um, this is something I'm passionate about. I'm going to show you a graph now, one of my few data points, that shares with you some of the, the um, productivity of our department in the last few years. This is the amount of grant support we've gotten from um, outside agencies. So this is us trying to convince people that, um, that we have good ideas and they should give us some, some money to test those ideas. Um, the department started in 2016 with a research base of about $300,000. We're now over, going to be spend over $3 million this year in new, um, in new research dollars. And we think this is just the tip of the iceberg. So I'm really excited about where we've come in two years. Um, we, we think, hope this is going to keep going up and up and up. But that's not all we're doing as a department, because one of the things that I was fortunate to inherit in this is that we have a really terrific group of instructors that are dedicated to teaching the next generation of researchers and the next generation of dietitians. And so central to our department mission is innovation and education. Now, I didn't tell you, my father, not only was he a diabetic, but he actually was a faculty member and a department chair and an associate dean in a school of education. And my father used to rant at the dinner table about how terrible it was that we lectured so much to students and that we should be much more active. So we've introduced a whole bunch of new programs to get lectures out of the department. We do something called team-based learning, which is something we did at Duke, where students learn mainly by active learning, by working in groups, by not sitting in the classroom passively. We've introduced something called culinary medicine. Teresa Dvorak here, who runs our culinary medicine program. It's a really innovative program we do with the School of Medicine, where the, the um, medical students, the dietitians, other health professionals, they get in a kitchen, they make a meal, and then they talk about how that meal and how those diet recommendations can be used to affect the disease prognosis. And then the last thing we wanted to do was take this out into the community. And how can we take the knowledge we're learning here and how can we use the students that we're training here to go into the community, engage them, and empower them to take control of their own health. And I was thrilled when Julie Meadows took charge of this uh, new Utah Center for Community Nutrition and has launched a whole bunch of programs and she's going to tell you about them so I'm not going to steal her thunder on that in the last talk. So this is the vision for the department. I have a whole bunch of people here that participate in different aspects of this. I mentioned Teresa. Allison Reeder is our Director of Teaching and Learning. She's taken on a new role develop, pushing innovation in that aspect. I'm sure I'm missing some people who are floating around the room but I encourage you to reach out to them and ask them questions if you have them. And thank you again for coming. OK. So it, it's my pleasure. I also get to be the MC of the evening, I think. So it's my pleasure to introduce our latest new faculty hire. This is Mary Playden. Uh, Mary is the major draw tonight. She's going to talk about I Know What You Ate Last Summer. <laughs> Mary got her PhD at Yale. Um, she then did a postdoc with the National Cancer Institute, and she's uh, our department big data person who's talking about how we can screen hundreds of thousands of cohorts instead of a few mice. And so, welcome. Thank you very much, everyone, for having me. I'm very excited to be here today. Can you all hear me okay? I just want to double check. How's that? Okay. So today I'm going to talk to you about the fact that I know what you ate last summer. 
So my mother is a three times cancer survivor and I would do anything to help her to live a longer and a healthier life. That's a picture of her in the corner there. Um, I took that just this last summer when she was out here visiting me. And something that her and many other people that have cancer ask about is, what can I eat so that I can live better with cancer? Just to get a sense from the audience, how many of you know somebody that has been affected by cancer in some way? You can see that almost every hand up is in the room because one in two men and one in three women will be affected at some time in their life um, with some form of cancer. But my story actually starts even before my mother got diagnosed with cancer when I was working with a research group in Colorado and we were studying different types of diets and how they influence markers in the blood of survival among women with uh, breast cancer. And the women that I was working with were incredibly motivated and they were incredibly appreciative to be contributing to research that could help shed light on what people should be eating to enhance their survival after a diagnosis of cancer. <coughs> and these women truly inspired me to follow up on this question and so then I took my own journey over to the East Coast uh, to do a PhD at Yale and then the postdoctoral fellowship at the, at the National Cancer Institute because I wanted to equip myself with the skills that I would need to tackle this really important and really complex question. My work that I'm going to tell you a little bit more about, it encompasses, like Scott said, large studies, novel technologies that can measure your metabolism, and also emerging um, statistical methods. <coughs> And the University of Utah and the Huntsman Cancer Institute, where I'm also appointed as an investigator, um, they are particularly skilled in all of these areas and uh, that was one of the things that influenced my decision to come to Utah. The university, I think, has also done a really good job of integrating departments like nutrition and integrative physiology with organizations like the Huntsman Cancer Institute and their research resources so that we can collectively collaborate together to address common problems related to cancer. So another hand up, how many of you have gotten confused by messages that you hear in the media about nutrition at some point? <laughs> Well, a lot of hands up as well. Do you recall earlier this year when a judge in California ruled that Starbucks and other coffee companies would have to put a cancer warning on their products? This was in, in uh, response to the fact that there's a chemical acrylamide in coffee that's present in very, very small amounts that's been designated as a carcinogen. That was based on animal studies where the animals received huge doses of this chemical. And so when this happened, the public understandably got very alarmed because a lot of America loves their coffee. They drink a lot of coffee. And <clears throat> but it turns out that in California, the Office of Environmental Hazard Assessment determined that the amount of acryl acrylamide in coffee is so small that it doesn't pose a health issue in humans. And in fact, it's also present in a lot of other foods as well, including French fries. But then... Um, the, the ruling was actually reversed. But then we get these other large studies that are coming out saying that drinking coffee actually reduces the risk of death from all causes, including cancer. And so is everybody confused yet? <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I certainly talk to a lot of people that ask me, you know, I hear one thing one day and another thing another day, what does this all mean? And so when more research comes out and the media is putting out these conflicting messages, People um, generally get confused about what are the best foods to eat. They distrust nutrition messages in general. And that can have a really negative effect on people's intentions to adopt healthy behaviors. And for public health, that's really not what we want. We want consistent nutrition messages. We want people to adopt healthy behaviors. So why are nutrition messages so conflicting? particularly in relation to cancer. Um, there are a lot of reasons for this, and I'll just outline a few of them. One is that it's incredibly difficult to measure diet, and sometimes it's inaccurate with some of the tools that we use, um, dietary questionnaires, certain dietary questionnaires, for example. And then it's also unethical to run certain trials of potentially harmful foods, so those trials are not done in humans. And then for potentially helpful foods, there's often issues with people not complying very well with the diet. 
And so that makes it very difficult to detect signals. And on top of all of this, we have cancer, uh, an incredibly complex disease. Cancer of one organ is not one disease. Actually, it's many diseases at the molecular level. And I've just got one example up here for breast cancer, where a study recently um, categorized the tumors into eight, at least eight different molecular subtypes. And so in the past, when people were asking research questions about diet and total cancer, they were asking the wrong question because cancer is many diseases. And so it's really no wonder that we don't have all of the answers yet. And so I asked myself, what can we do to address this issue? This is a really critical issue. And one way that I've been developing is uh, to, to uh, use novel technologies to develop new ways and better ways to measure diet and to understand how diet influences our metabolism and um, to, uh, we can detect chemicals in food uh, in your blood and in your urine using this novel technology called metabolomics. Metabolomics is the study of small chemicals which are called metabolites. We can pick up natural food chemicals, we can pick up additives, we can measure how food influences your internal metabolism but also the metabolism of food by your gut bacteria. And um, I'm very excited with the work um, that we're doing in this area. The goal is that with better diet measures, we can provide you with really more accurate answers to these diet and cancer questions. So here are just some examples of some chemicals that we can pick up in your blood um, related to what you eat. And we've actually detected hundreds of these now at this point. And the way that we identified them uh, initially was to do large studies at the National Cancer Institute where we looked at the relationship of blood metabolites with uh, what people ate. This was, these initial studies were based on what people reported that they ate, so that's not ideal. Um, but still we were able to detect these markers and then we were able to replicate it many, many times in other studies. Uh, what is important about these studies is that we measured people's long-term diet. So what did you eat over the last year? And that's important because cancer is a disease that takes a long time to develop. And so we're interested in long-term diet, not just what you ate yesterday or last week. And then we also did a highly controlled feeding study to follow up on these results because we wanted to make sure that what we were observing was really valid. And something that I think is really excited about this type of method is that not only can we tell that you ate the food, but we can detect chemicals that can tell us how the food was processed, how it was prepared. For example, did you drink dark roast coffee or light roast coffee? And so it gives us a lot of detail, food detail. And like I mentioned before, we can um, detect how your gut bacteria are metabolizing it. We can also pick up chemicals with health effects, including cancer prevention properties. And so how can all of this that I've been describing help us to determine what people should eat to prevent cancer or to live better with cancer? I'll just tell you briefly, briefly about one study that we did, um, which was the first of its kind, where we looked at how nutritional metabolites link to the risk of developing breast cancer. And what we were able to do is to detect specific chemicals from alcohol that were found to increase breast cancer risk. And this reinforced what we already knew about alcohol because we know there's a link with alcohol and breast cancer. But it also pointed towards markers in our internal metabolism, um, specific metabolic pathways that link drinking alcohol with cancer, including um, certain sex, ho sex hormones. And then we were also able to detect very specific fats from things like dairy fat and the fat used to fry foods that we found to be related to higher breast cancer risk. And then we also detected some markers of taking vitamin E supplements that appeared to be protective. Uh, and so this type of study just gives you a sense of how we can use this technology um, to study the relationship between diet and cancer. Um, and right now I'm replicating this in two other big studies because replication is very important. And I'm also doing another similar study but looking at metabolites in relation to endometrial cancer. Now we're also interested in your overall diet, not just individual foods because you don't just eat one food at a time and the, all of the foods that you eat, they interact to influence your metabolic health and your disease risk. 
And uh, Scott already told you about ceramides, which is the new cholesterol. Uh, so in some preliminary data from a feeding study, we found that um, your overall diet quality is related to certain metabolic pathways, and that includes ceramide metabolism. And so that's really telling us that it's not necessarily a magic bullet single food that we necessarily should be targeting, but your overall diet quality and your overall dietary pattern. Now moving forward, what I'd like to do is to take these metabolites and use them as biomarkers to help determine what is the best diet for each and every one of you based on your genetics, your metabolism, your gut microbes, your lifestyle and your environment. There are new, what we call big data approaches that combine um, certain methods that have been used in computer science, like artificial intelligence, um, combining it with um, biostatistics and, um, and the biological sciences. And I want to leverage all of that to help to address this question. Um, the university actually uh, has excellent departments in all of these areas and in bioinformatics and so I'm hoping to collaborate with them to work on, a, on such a project to take your molecular and your lifestyle information um, and use it to predict what's going to work for each and every one of you. So coming back full circle, uh, we are now accumulating more and more evidence of the relationship between diet and cancer and this is an example of some of the recommendations that have come out recently just this year from the World Cancer Research Fund. But what we can do now is we can really strengthen that evidence and we can build on it so that we can really determine what's going to work for, for all of you in, in, in terms of your health. Um, and I'm very happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll give you a chance to ask questions and afterwards and you can easily come up and, and talk to any of us individually if that's, if that's better for you. So last but not least, I want to introduce Julie Meadows. So Julie is probably familiar to a lot of you. Julie uh, got her master's in public health at um, UC Berkeley, uh, got her PhD here, joined the department. Um, and Julie has done uh, an enormous amount of work in the department and a lot of administrative stuff. She was the director of the CMP program for a while. She was the interim chair. Um, and she's just uh, been phenomenal. But one of the things that when I was interviewing for the job, I was asking Julie about the types of things she really wanted to do. And, you know, one of the things she expressed to me was this real passion for getting out in the community and getting engaged with folks. And so she's developed in the last two years this Utah Center for Community Nutrition, which is just going phenomenally well. And so I, I look forward to introducing Julie Meadows. My job is to translate what these brilliant people say into what we should really eat and to teach people out in the community about these principles and how they can apply them to their life. So first of all, I wanted to tell you what the area I work in is called translational health. And so it's a discipline that we have that tra translates all of this biomedical information and public health research into things we can do for the community into the, and tra uh, translate those findings into diagnostic tools, medicines, procedures, policies, and education. And in my case, it's mostly the last part and highlighted there, the policies and education. 
So many of you might know about the social determinants of health. And what we know from research is that about 60% of our health is predicted by what we call the social determinants. So things like air quality, food, economics, your economic status, the community you live in, and your educational status. And about 20% is from genetics and 20% from healthcare. So I feel really strongly that we need to be working in these the 60%. And if you look at the picture more closely, you can see that all of these things apply to the things we're talking about tonight, except for maybe air quality. So we're talking about food, in my center we talk a lot about economics because we have to translate these recommendations into food that people can afford. We know that people live in communities that have lower socioeconomic status, have more risk. We know that the community that you live in really affects the food you eat and that we like to eat with family and with our friends and so it's very important to food. And we also know that education affects your overall health and your nutritional status. So this is the domain that I work in along with many of the people in this room that I'll introduce as we go along. The other model that we use is called the socio-ecologic model. The socio-ecologic model is kind of a macro model and in our center this is kind of how we think. So we think at the middle that there are individual factors that we have to address when we're helping people change their diet. There's demographic factors that I mentioned, there's psychosocial factors. I don't suppose any of you eat when you're feeling stressed out. No, probably not, no. And then there's genetics. And then on the right-hand side, there's policy, different resources we have, and our different cultural values. And then kind of in the middle there are the behavioral settings. So the settings in which we eat really influence how we eat and what we eat. So we eat in communities, we eat at work, we eat all those little nuts and candies at work, I don't know. We eat with other people, we eat when we're in healthcare, we eat at schools, and we eat at home. So you'll see as we go through some of the programs we're doing that we really focus on these settings, these behavioral settings. In other words, we go to where the people are. Now, the other thing we know is that the things that people eat in our country don't really align very well with what Mary was talking about or what Scott was talking about. We have some room for improvement. So this is information we use from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. So they survey people across the country every so many years and they do very rigorous, um, some blood work and rigorous dietary survey methods. And they look at the kinds of foods people eat broken down to in simple basic food groups. And if you look at at this, the orange bars are kind of the bad bars, and the blue bars are the good bars. So if you look at vegetables, this is a number in the orange, the percent of the population that doesn't get enough vegetables, and the blue is the percentage that does. You get the idea? You look on down, and you're thinking of the things that we're discovering, and when we translate it, we know that we're pretty far off, right? So things like added sugars, saturated fats, sodium, we have a lot of room to improve. Scott already told you about culinary medicine, but that's one of the first programs I wanted to tell you about that we kind of embrace. It's actually a partnership with the Department of Family and Preventive Medicine and the School of Medicine and our department, and Teresa is our leader on that. What you see here are some medical students that are completing the course, and when they take this course, they do case studies, they have to read about nutrition, they work with the physician and dietitian to talk about lifestyle change, how they can make it themselves, how they can help other people do it, what's the language you use, how do you pull the feelings out of people to help them want to make these changes. And then they do case studies and it's and then we've brought in, which is kind of unique, other students from across health sciences like pharmacists and nurses and etc. And so we have this multidisciplinary team learning about nutrition together in an applied way. So it's very exciting. I, I couldn't resist showing you some of the food because Teresa sent me some pictures of food and I'm like, oh, I got to show them that. That's pretty cool. Some beautiful um, food on the left, some soup and some Indian food. They make some really delicious things. It's actually kind of hard to work in our department because you smell these delicious foods all the time. And it, I mean, it's great, but it makes you want to eat all the time. Um, the next thing I wanted to tell you about are the three programs that we have in our center that have been funded by Driving Out Diabetes. Now, Driving Out Diabetes is a really broad program, and it 
many of the people in this room that are here have heard about it or work in driving out diabetes, but I just wanted to give a broad overview of the three components. So on the left hand side in the kind of orangey color, it says closing the gap for clinical care. In this area, we have a program on campus at the Diabetes Center that is called One Day Diabetes. So if you have type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes, you can come on a Friday from all over the region. People come from Wyoming, Nevada, etc. And because you have a chronic disease, sometimes it's hard to stay motivated. I don't suppose you can relate to that. But when you have to think about what you're eating, exercise, and measure your blood sugar, and blah, 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 it gets fatiguing and you need a little shot in the arm, so to speak. And so on this day, you come and all the health professionals work with you. The physicians, the nurse practitioners, the dietitians, the exercise people. And they work with you and they do activities together and they kind of buff you out. And then one of our students goes over from nutrition and makes a really beautiful, healthy lunch. So you can feel that sense that you don't have to be miserable with diabetes. So that's been really cool. And in the red, this program, um, focuses on research and with some of these funds we've been able to fund some really talented researchers on campus that do work in diabetes and so that's been a really great part of our program and there's already been two rounds of research funding and then the most important area the green um, education and re prevention um, this is where we're going out in the community to reach people where they are. Later on tonight, you'll have the opportunity to see the wellness bus outside here and visit the wellness bus. The wellness bus is a Winnebago that we converted into kind of a nice clinic and education center. And this bus is focused in on educating people. So you can have your glucose tested, you can get get your, high, your blood pressure tested, and then you can meet with health coaches that speak your language and live in your community about how to manage your diabetes if you have it or how to prevent it ideally. This bus has been going around in more of our communities in Salt Lake County that have a high prevalence of diabetes. So they go on different days. One day they go to Kearns, one day they go to Midvale, South Salt Lake, Glendale on, on each day. So it's not just a one-time thing. We come back. So you can come back and get the ongoing type of coaching that you need to change your chronic disease. The other programs that are in here are some clinical programs in some of our clinics that use a health coach and a registered dietitian. Um, and the ones that I want to tell you about are very early prevention. So in our center, we mostly do very early prevention, primarily focused around children, adolescents, and families. So if you look on your left, th these three programs are described. And these are very exciting programs. I just have to tell you. I'll tell you some stories as I go along. The first one on the left is Food Movement and You. Food, Food Movement and You is a program for families that are living in a homeless shelter or in transitional care. This is a very unique program. We've only been able to find one other place that does it and they're not really doing research on it. And it's, it's really impactful um, for us to be there and to give four interactive lessons over four weeks. And we do seminars for the personnel and we are working towards changing some of the environment of the homeless centers, the nutrition environment, the foods that we see there. What we do, and we've already reached, as you can see, almost 500 people in the last year. And what we do is we do these rotating. So we go four weeks, take a week or two off, go back. Because the people are coming through these institutions. And we do it at South Valley Sanctuary, the House of Hope, the Midvale Road Home, and the Volunteers of America. Really exciting program. We also do a program called Crush Diabetes, which is for middle school students. This came out of a documentary film that was done by a local filmmaker, Jenny McKenzie, called Sugar Babies. One day I was viewing the film and I noticed that it was 40 minutes long. And I thought to myself, hmm, that's kind of the same length as a class period. And then there was a young woman sitting with me and she was in eighth grade and she said, I love that film. That was so cool. Those kids were so neat in that film. So I thought this would be a great thing to develop a curriculum, train health teachers how to use it, use the film, all health teachers and teachers in general like a film every now and then, throw in the film, talk a little bit about it before and after, and maybe we could measure what their learning was. So in the first go round, we found out that their knowledge increased and their intent to change their behaviors increased. That's about all we could do without measuring more things. So when this funding came about through the Driving Out Diabetes, we expanded this program. And so now we do schools throughout Utah, Southern Idaho, and Northern Arizona. And so far, this 
past year we reached close to 8,000 participants, meaning the students. And Sarah Elizabeth, who's here in the back, she just told me the other day that this year we've already reached 11,000 more students. So it's a dissemination program. It's something we just disseminate, but it seems to be really valued and really well received and a great way to get an early prevention of diabetes message out there to kids. And the final one is called Team Thrive. Team Thrive is our attempt to make high school health education around nutrition and physical activity fun and exciting. Okay, so in Team Thrive, um, we have developed a curriculum that instead of teaching kids like there's four calories in a gram of carbohydrate, how exciting. We instead, what we do is we get them involved in activities and changing behaviors. So for example, um, we might do something like have them take pictures, kids love to take pictures, pictures of all the food they eat and then have a discussion about it the next day. At any rate, um, I just came today from Price, which is in Carbon County. We're testing this in uh, the school districts you can see there, Cedar City, Kearns, West Jordan, Carbon, and Emory. And we have case schools and control schools and all of that. But we measure, we take a lot of measurements before, after, and then one month later. And I wanted to tell you just a little bit about each of these programs a little bit more. Now, when we talk about food environment, this is what we see at the Midvale Road home when we walk in every day. Okay. I don't go every day, but when people from our team go every day, this is what they see. Now this is common in our field to walk in somewhere to do some nutrition education and see a lovely display of what not to eat. Um, and so what we'd like to do, in, instead of saying, nya, 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 which doesn't work, is to work with the personnel there and start by giving like brown bag lunches, start a dialogue about food. Right now they say we don't do food, we're just here for shelter. But talk a little bit about how food helps people make the next change in their life, how it gives them the energy to do them, how it gives them the locus of control or the self-efficacy to make changes that they need to make that are really hard changes like finding a house, finding enough money to keep their kid clothed. All of those things take good energy, right? And this isn't really what we think would be the good energy. But we can't go in and say that and we can't can't go tell people we don't want you to donate food to this place anymore. We just have to start having a discussion about what could you donate that would have a benefit that would, might not um, harm someone's health, right? So we have to have those hard dis discussions and we've started that a little bit this year in this environment. This is crush diabetes because in crush diabetes, besides the curriculum, the schools can have a diabetes health fair and a film screening. So we take the film, we take Jenny McKenzie, the filmmaker, we, you know, we have a healthy snacks and things like that, and then we show the film and families can come and things like that. And this is my colleague in the middle, Carmen, and she's at a school where we were there doing a diabetes health fair, and you can see everyone was very excited about it. A very fun, a fun environment. We like to make things fun so that people like them. And this is a little bit more about Team Thrive. So um, in the red, if you can see the red, I, are some of the unique things that we do. So we have peer mentors. There's a few people in this room that are, have been peer mentors. Raise your hand, please. Yes. Excellent peer mentors. So these are graduate students and undergraduate students in our department that we train extensively, actually, <laughs> um, to be, be involved in Food Movement U and Team Thrive, and they serve as peer mentors. So they're either on the site when the classes are being taught and talk about how they do it with the different kinds of groups that we form, the different teams we form, or in some locations we've done it um, by text, because everybody loves text, right? So the mentors talk to the kids in the classroom. We do a lot of photo journaling, which I already kind of mentioned, but how that works is maybe like this. We say, you get points for taking pictures of their food, and with your permission, today I'm gonna show some of the foods you turned in yesterday. So they show the foods the kid had for breakfast, and it looked like a pretty healthy breakfast, and they say, can you share with us and share in your group how you made those decisions? How did you decide to eat that? And they're like, oh, well, you know, and how did you decide to have oatmeal and some fruit? Sometimes it's just that my mom and dad made it, or sometimes I was like, well, I thought I wanted to eat healthy today. Or maybe the next day they show the lunch was at McDonald's across the street from the school. And it's like, how did you make that decision? 
we thought maybe you wanted to make it you had committed to make another decision, how could you get there? What are the things that we can think internally to get us to make those kinds of changes? Um, in the groups, that's what we call Team Thrive because there's little teams that we create in the classroom. They do a group documentary. These things are amazing. I would show them to you, but lots of kids don't want to give permission for us to show them, so we have to work on that. Um, and we do a lot, the kids make physical activity videos. Remember Scott said that physical activity was something that helps with ceramide, so we, we, we do that, um, and our peer mentors also get some training in physical activity so they can talk more about that. And then we do some of the more tr traditional things like myth busters or a nutrient of the day. So a very active learning environment. So how do we know these things work? This is the problem with early, early prevention, right? It's hard to know if it's going to work because I'm not going to be able to take these 15-year-olds and study them until they're 65 or something like that. So what we do is we study things that are in between measures. So we study things like um, their knowledge of the relationship between diet, exercise, and diabetes with surveys. We do diff we're, one of our outcomes with Team Thrive is to see if we can get them to eat less sugar. And so we do things like the surveys. We also collect these photos pre and post so we can do some photo analysis. We, another goal is to increase fruit and vegetable consumption. And we have this biophotonic scanner. Maybe I don't know if you've ever seen one, but you put your hand on it and it can measure your skin carotenoids. So carotenoids are higher in your bloodstream when you've been eating more fruits and vegetables. Turns out the kids absolutely love that machine. It's interesting. And I have a feeling, now all the research isn't in, but I have a feeling that might be an area where we make some significant difference. And then we have um, them do accelerometry, in this case Fitbits, and um, they also do some surveys. So we can get some of these things you have to do in between before you can prevent diabetes. I have to tell you that it's really pretty cool too because I'm really big into social disparities and I really love how we're out in the community working with kids all over rural and all over Utah and that's a big thing, theme at our university to be one university and a university for Utah and I think this represents that really well. Today I was in Price with some of my colleagues and I really can't tell you how excited 15 year olds in Price get about having a Fitbit. They think it's like Christmas five times over. It's really pretty cool and it's really cool how the teachers say nobody ever comes to help us or study us. We're really glad you're here. So we hear that a lot and that's really why I do that work, this work, because I think it's really important to reach people who don't always have a chance to participate in these types of programs or get this type of information. So a couple other programs in our center that are outside of the Driving Out Diabetes is right now we're considering doing a program called Kids in Nutrition or KIN. This would be for elementary school children and this is a program that was developed by a graduate student at Harvard and she's trying to recruit people across um, the university to do it. We also do a lot of work on campus about for in food recovery. We have students that work to recover food that hasn't been eaten and taken it to places where people need it. And then of course we do lots of community events including this one last week for Halloween at Soldier Hollow so we always have to go be the people that are amongst the candy and try to talk about nutrition and show how it's fun and interesting and give out things other than candy. So I just wanted to really thank you for your attention tonight and to really thank the people that work on these programs because we have um, a lot of dedicated students, faculty, and undergraduate students, and we've trained over 45 volunteers to work on these programs and we really couldn't do it without them. Now, I think that I am supposed to tell you that the wellness bus is going to be outside and that there are some more um, activities coming up. So in February, we're going to have a seminar called Oh My Aching Back, Solving the Myth That Opioids Are the Answer. That's with Dr. Julie Fritz from the College of Health. And in May, um, we're going to be talking about, for the first time in history, people sit more than they sleep. And Dr. Maria Newton is going to be talking a little about that epidemic, so to speak. So thanks again, and I think we'll all come up to take questions. I think being respectful of your time, uh, I'll ask Scott and, and Mary and Julie to stay in the front, and if you'd like to come up when we finish and ask them a question. 
that would be great. Um, Scott is uh, providing just terrific leadership of the College of uh, Health and the Department of Nutrition and Integrative Physiology, and I appreciate the tour around the world, but you're at your final resting place. <laughs> you're not going anywhere. Among Scott's uh, terrific uh, recruits has been Mary, and in addition to the important work that Mary is doing in the College of Health, she's providing a really crucial link for the college and the department with the Huntsman Cancer Institute. And uh, she's been very, very helpful in, uh, in, in uh, moving that relationship forward and, and doing great work. So thank you, Mary. And Julie, I always embarrass her when I say this, but in, in my mind, J Julie Matos is the face of diabetes prevention at the University of Utah and in Salt Lake. The work she's doing is incredibly important in the community, working with children and homeless and underserved populations, and is just doing great work. So Julie, thanks for all you, that you do for the, for the college and for the community. The, the College of Health and the Department of Nutrition and Integrative Physiology are having unprecedented success in seeking and receiving federal funding in support of our research program. And as Scott mentioned, uh, his department alone has gone to about $3 million this year. And as a college, we've gone to over $8 million in awards this year. That said, Many of you are benefactors to the College of Health and the support provided by donors to our faculty and to our students is absolutely crucial to giving us the flexibility to what we really need to do to excel. And so I just want to thank all of you who have supported the College of Health um, for that support. And a lot of our success is due to your, um, your support. If you have questions about um, giving to the College of Health, Courtney Garay is our Director of Advancement, and her colleagues uh, Stephen and, and Ashley and Matt are here and can answer any questions that you have. But I just want to thank you so much um, for your support of the College of Health. Special treat, Julie mentioned that the wellness bus is here. It's really worth checking out. And so, it, it, Ashley, is it here outside? Which side? This side. Okay, so if you'd like to check out um, the, the wellness bus, uh, please do that. This is, making, uh, this is part of the Miller Foundation gift, Driving Out Diabetes Initiative, getting out into the community, again, working with underserved populations, really making an impactful uh, contribution to the health and wellness of citizens of uh, Salt Lake City. So please check that out. Thank you for coming, and have a great evening.